I hope you guys are doing well this morning. Um, As many of you know, I spent a couple weeks in Africa uh, at the beginning of March. And uh, for two weeks, Pastor Aiken preached on Sunday mornings and preached through chapter 4 of 1 Corinthians. And uh, I appreciate Pastor Aiken and listened to those messages and uh, appreciated the word that he brought and just the ministry time. And uh, we saw some people saved during those couple weeks, which was exciting. Uh, then the, the weeks after that, uh, Craig Keene was with us, a missionary extraordinaire, which, by the way, we have picked up for monthly support and uh, two powerful messages. And I want to encourage you uh, to go back online and listen to both of those messages. If you're here first service, um, you can listen to second service. It was a completely different message. Or if you're here second, you need to hear first service as well. And I just want to encourage you with that. Uh, Craig Keen uh, and those messages are online. And then last week, uh, my family and I, we'd been planning for about six months to be away in Gatlinburg, Tennessee for spring break. And uh, we went with Jessica's family and uh, her sister and uh, her sister's kids and family. And then also Jessica's parents and we uh, got a house uh, up in the mountains and got away and some, uh, some time of rest and relaxation and we ate a ton of good food. And, uh, but I, I want you to know, as well rested as I was, I, I feel like coming back, uh, coming back this morning, uh, I'm tired. I'm like, what in the world? <laughs> and uh, we drove all night or all day on Friday, got here yesterday morning, and, uh, and then I was working yesterday on the message uh, for today. And, uh, but I want you to know my heart was here uh, these last several weeks, even though we weren't here physically, uh, my heart was here. And, and I also want you to know that we're here to stay, okay? <laughs> and so uh, we're, we're going to be here for a while, and uh, we're excited about that. And uh, what's great is that it's God's Word that we've been studying. And we're in 1 Corinthians, and I've studied along the way. I've listened to the messages. And uh, how many appreciate Pastor Pete and his message last week, all right? That was pretty awesome. I gave him this difficult passage. It's just the way that it fell in, in, the, in the time. And, but it was God's Word, and God's Word rings true, doesn't it? And when we study God's Word, and uh, it, it, it's meaningful, it's powerful, it affects us. And Pete worked hard uh, to bring that message to you. It was a strong message. And I listened to it yesterday uh, before I started preparing for today. And I really appreciated his, his sensitivity, saying, let's not be desensitized sensitized by sin and how important that is for us to realize that we can be disgusted with sin. We need to be disgusted with sin. We need to deal with sin and use the Matthew 18 model to be able to do that. But I'll tell you, there were two standouts in his message last week that I don't think any of us will forget uh, for any time soon. And uh, I I don't know, uh, Deb, if, if Pete, you know, printed out the poem that he you know, shared with the people last week, um, but the uh, butt prints in the sand. I mean, I, I can't get that off my mind. I, you know, I listened to that yesterday. I'm thinking, okay, Pete. And, uh, and so, I mean, what a great, great illustration. And then the next time we have a, uh, a youth bake sale, just beware of the brownies, all right? <laughs> And, uh, and so we want to make sure we're aware. If you were here last week, you know what I'm talking about. But, uh, but Pete did a great job. He brought really two points home. The one was that sin affects us individually. That when you are living a life of sin, or when you're caught up in sin or habitual sin, it will affect your life. It may not happen right away, but it will. There's a... There's a uh, a degrading factor in our lives when we allow sin to get a hold of us. But not only does it affect us individually, it affects us corporately. It affects the body of Christ. It affects our reputation. And because of that, we need to take sin seriously. And we need to judge one another within the church and to be able to bring good accountability. Now today we're going to continue in chapter 6. We're going to kind of make a transition. But I want to remind you that the, the Corinthian church that we're studying and that we're, we're looking at here was written by Paul. It was the, the book of Corinthians was written by Paul to a people that he absolutely loved. He had given his heart. He had planted a church there. He had invested. He had poured into their lives. 
And within a few years after he left, within about three years, the church was struggling, seriously struggling with sin. They were struggling with disunity. They were struggling with wisdom and the cross and and all these things. They were in serious trouble. One commentator said that they were defiled, they were divided, and they were disgraced. Can you imagine the church being called that? Well, that's what the church in Corinth was. And what Corinthians is all about, and what I want to remind us, we've said this before, is that it, uh, Corinthians is about confronting the challenges of following Christ while living in this world. And what happened for the church in Corinth, in that first century church, can happen to us right here today in 2014. And there are so many cultural and so many uh, different uh, parallels to what we deal with. And we'll even see that this morning. And today as we read chapter 6, we're going to try to accomplish uh, verses 1 through 11. Uh, You're going to see a connection to chapter 5, which Pete talked about, and a connection to which we'll talk about in a couple weeks uh, of of the end of chapter 6. And Paul, as he continues, he continues this argument that the church must not judge those outside of the church, but must judge those inside. And it's important. That's an important thing that to remember. And with the immoral brother, of course, which we studied last week, uh, not only there, but also with matters of everyday life when one member has a grievance against another. We're going to see that. Paul is saying that we will we'll see here that if the church is not to judge the outside, neither should it go outside of the church with its inside affairs. And I want you to turn with me to, to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. I'm going to ask that you stand with me. We're going to read God's Word. We're going to honor God's Word in this way. And as we read these verses, I want you to see a couple things from Paul's perspective. First of all, there, as he writes this, he is horrified by what he has heard about the church. Then there's a series of rhetorical questions, and what that means is there are questions that have, there's no answer, but we know the answer is implied. There's sarcasm in, this, in these 11 verses, and then even a threat there, and it's a very interesting passage. But let's read God's Word together. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, starting in verse number 1. It says, if any of you has a dispute with another, dare he take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the saints? Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will also judge angels? How much more the things of this life? Therefore, if you have disputes about such matters, appoint as judges even men as little account in the church. I say this to shame you. Is it possible that there is, there is nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers? But instead, one brother goes to law against another, and this in front of unbelievers? The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means you have been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong, and you do this to your brothers. Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, uh, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanders, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. Now before we uh, pray, before we uh, turn, before we um, tackle this. I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. You say, why in the world overall would Paul be writing this to the Corinthian believers? And we'll see this in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 23. Look what it says, just a page over probably. It says, I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessing. 
The reason that Paul is sharing this is because of the gospel of Christ. And then in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, we also see uh, the reason why. He says, so whether, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, including bringing this, this uh, text here in 1 Corinthians 6, no matter whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. He's doing it for unity's sake. He's doing it uh, so that the reputation of the believers and of the church would not be harmed. And it's all done for the glory of God. And what I want us to see here today, as we, as we pray even now and ask God to help us through this, is that our lives are meant to bring God glory. And this word, even though it's a harsh word, and there's some sarcasm, there's these rhetorical questions. We're going to try to get our minds around it. And I'm asking that we'll be able to apply it to our lives. And so I want you to do something with me. I did this in Africa, just felt led to do that every time I, was, uh, every time I stood up to preach. Um, I'm just going to ask that you put your hands in the air for a minute, okay? And I, I want us just to ask the Lord to give us everything that He wants us to get this morning that our hearts would be open, that our hearts would be able to receive everything He has for us, and that God's He would just pour out His Spirit on us and that we'd bring application into our lives. So with our hands raised, would you just repeat after me? Say, Dear Heavenly Father, pour out Your Spirit on me. Help me to listen and to discern Your Word. Help me to learn today. Help me to grow today. And help your word to change me from the inside out. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can be seated this morning. So let me give you a little history uh, back uh, to talk about Corinth for a moment. We said that the Corinth church had some serious issues. And uh, Paul is tackling one by one at this point through uh, 1 Corinthians. And in this text, he's specifically talking about two brothers. We don't know the names of the brothers, but there was an argument. There was a legal dispute. And in verse 1, we see that it's very specific, kind of brought attention to these two brothers. But then in verses 2 through 11, it's brought in to the community. The church is addressed in verses 2 through 11. And the fact that these two brothers were not getting along, it was bad for not only those two brothers, but it was bad for the church. And what I want you to remember is that Corinth, it was influenced heavily by the Roman culture. Remember? And even though it was in Greece, they they were influenced incredibly uh, by their culture. And that culture was prone to litigation, to legal matters, to legal disputes. At the drop of the hat, they were suing one another. They were bringing things before, before the public crowds. They were bringing people to the Bema seat, which we talked about, uh, which is right out in, in front of everybody. It would be like, uh, it, it'd be like you know, um, uh, Judge Judy on, on TV. or you know, it, was, it was like that, that bringing all their dirty laundry out in front for everyone to see. And we have that in our culture even today. And the Corinthian Christians were merely following the ways of the world instead of seeking the wisdom and the direction from the Lord. Paul's saying, look, what audacity for the, those that are justified to go before the unjustified in order to seek justice. You following me? Paul is saying that the Corinthian saints are more capable of dealing with trivial matters than bringing it out in front of the public. And he's saying, look, this is important. And in verse 1, we see that. We see right off the bat, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1, that we see that, look, there's a right and a wrong way to handle disputes among brothers and sisters. Let's look at it. It says, if any of you has a dispute with another, dare he take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the saints. Now, we don't know what the particular issue was. Most commentators believe that it was probably an issue over property, 
Uh, It was most likely an issue where a wealthy Christian was taking advantage of a less wealthy Christian in the same same, um, church. They're bringing it to the public courts. There were two brothers here, one of high status, most likely, one of lower status. And the wealthy, uh, through their influence, through their cleverness, they could manipulate the courts outside of the church. And what was happening is that they were taking advantage of the poor and the weak. That's what most likely was happening. You say, why? Why was that happening? Or what was going on in the culture at that time? Well, that culture was obsessed with the acquisition of property. They were obsessed with their own rights. And they were obsessed with everything that was opposite of what a Christian should be. A servant, which we saw in chapter 3. And so they were doing just the opposite of what what they were called to. And in verse 1, it says, when it says, Dare he take it before the ungodly? And the, the tone there is, How dare you take it before the ungodly? Paul is outraged here. He is disappointed with the Corinthian church. And he's being being very upfront. He's being very honest with them. He's saying, look, this should not happen. And then in verse 2, he says this. He says, do you not know? See, there's a profound problem here in Corinth. They should have known better. They should have been taught. They were taught by Paul. And they, but they were not living it out. And this little phrase, do you not know, was seen all throughout 1 Corinthians. And 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Do you not know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's Spirit lives in you? 1 Corinthians 5.6 says, Your boasting is not good. This is what Pastor Pete talked about. Do you not know that a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough? In chapter 6, there are five different times, verse 2, verse 3, verse 9, verse 15, verse 16, and verse 19. Again, where Paul is saying, do you not know? uh, Chapter 9, verse 13 says, do you not know that that those who work in the temple get food from the temple? And then in chapter 9, verse 24, the last time, do you not know that in a race, all the runners race, but only one gets the prize and what's, what's interesting about this, I believe you know, when we look at the culture, we look at what Paul's been doing up to this point, we understand that the Corinthian church, they were puffed up with their own wisdom, they are puffed up with their, with their own knowledge, and, they, and he is addressing their supposed wisdom. He's saying, look, don't you know, you should know these things. And he's saying, look, it's, a, it's an attack to that whole idea of this godly wisdom versus man's wisdom, again, that we saw in chapters 1, 2, and 3. And he's reminding them, look, godly wisdom is rooted in the cross. And so we see that in chapter, uh, chapter 6, verse 2. It says, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Verse 3, do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? You say, where, is, where are we getting this? This is obviously something that had been taught to the Corinthian church. And... Um, it's important, and these are obvious truths, truths that were eluding the Corinthian uh, believers. They were living completely ignorant of these realities. But you say, well, where do we find in Scripture that these were the, this is the case? Well, I want to take you on a little journey. Uh, turn with me to Matthew chapter 19, verse 28. And uh, once you're there, uh, we'll, we'll read there. And then Revelation chapter 20 Verse 4 will be our second one. But I want to look at a couple of these verses that talk about us as believers that we will become judges. 
And uh, that because it can be kind of a foreign idea, something we don't talk about all that often, that we will sit at judge uh, as judges and we will reign with Christ. And I want you to see this. Matthew chapter 19, verse 28, Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth at the renewal of all things. And so that's when Jesus returns for the church, when the, when the church will reign and rule, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, you, this is the believer, those who have Jesus in their heart, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 20, and we'll look at verse 4. A similar idea here. Revelation chapter 4, or I mean 20, verse 4. This is, it says, I saw thrones, this is John's revelation, on which were seated those who had been given authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony for Jesus and because of the word of God. They had not worshipped the beast and his image and had not received his mark on their forehead or on their hands. They came to life and they reigned with Christ a thousand years. We see in Scripture that we, the believers, we will sit as judges. We will reign with Christ. And then what about these angels? Turn with me to 2 Peter chapter 2. Very interesting uh, verses here. 2 Peter chapter 2 and then also Jude uh, verse 6 talking about angels, that we're going to judge even the angels. Look what it says, uh, chapter 2, verse 4 in, first, in Second Peter. It says, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, he's talking about the fallen angels, but sent them to hell, putting them into gloomy dungeons to be held for judgment. One day the fallen angels will be judged along with all of the other sinners. And we, the saints, we will be the judge. We will judge with Christ in those moments. And let's turn to one other place, Jude. There's only one chapter, so Jude, verse 6. It says, And the angels who did not keep their positions of authority, but abandoned their own home. These are the fallen angels. These have uh, these he has kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains for judgment on the great day. There will be a day of judgment for the angels. There will be a day of judgment for all of us. But those who are redeemed, those who have Jesus in their heart, we will reign and rule. We'll sit with Jesus as a judge. We will reign with Christ. And that's what Paul is saying here in 1 Corinthians. He's saying, look, isn't it, uh, look, you can deal with matters within the church. One day you're going to do this. Christians will judge the world, will judge angels. So don't go to the world now for justice. Does that make sense? And so it, it's, it, it's an interesting uh, topic here. In verse 4 of chapter uh, 6 of 1 Corinthians, let's continue. He goes on and he says this. So he says, look, don't you know that you will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? And then in verse 4, he says, therefore, if you have disputes about such matters, and this could be any kind of trivial matters, appoint as judges even men of little account in the church. What is Paul saying here? He's saying even the least among the Christian believers have the ability to discern right from wrong in regards to trivial matters. Even the weakest, it could be in there, even a slave. Remember that in that culture, in the Corinthian church, there would have been wealthy, then there would have been slaves even that were a part of the church. And even a slave, even the youngest believer, even the weakest, could judge one another. Talking to the church as a whole, he's saying, look, there is no need to take these trivial matters outside of the church. And and this is strong. And in verse 5, he says, look, I say this to shame you. 
because they've been taking it out into the public courts. He's saying, no, that's not the way it should be. He says, is it possible? This is obviously a rhetorical question. Is it possible that there is nobody among the wise enough to judge a dispute between believers, but instead one brother goes to the law against another, and this is in front of the unbelievers, out in the open, airing the dirty laundry for everyone to see. And he's saying, this is shameful. It's shameful. This behavior cannot be tolerated in the Christian community. And just like the immoral brother that we studied last week, you need to change your ways when it comes to judging one another. You say, why is it so important? There's two reasons why it's so important. The first is because it was affecting the unity within the church. There was grievances, there was these problems um, that were arising, and they were trivial, small things, and most, most likely uh, relating to land or renting land, uh, but they were causing disunity in the church. But then secondly, it was affecting the, re- the reputation of Christ in the community. It was giving the church, it was giving Christians a bad name. And in that context, those, those brothers that are talked about here, we don't know their names, but they were, they're all about self-protection, about self-gain. Um, they were acting just like the pagans were. They were greedy, they were fraudulent. And Paul, he's saying, look, hasn't anything changed in your lives? You follow Christ you say you follow Christ, but, but the way you're living is just like the world. And he's saying, look, it can't continue on this way. Let's look at verse 7. It says, the very fact that you have lawsuits among you means that you've been completely defeated already. He says, look, whether you win an argument or you lose, it doesn't matter. Your actions are causing you to lose within the church and even within the community in regards to your testimony. He says, why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong and you do this to your brothers. Paul's saying here, he's suggesting, look, go ahead and live with the wrong. Embrace it. Just live with it. Swallow hard. Take the loss and move on. Why would someone do that? Why would a believer just, just take an offense and, uh, and just move on? For the sake of the gospel. So others may be reached. So others will not be tainted with discord for the sake of the gospel and this really is rooted in matthew chapter 5 i want you to turn with me there this is jesus in his great address to the um uh to the to the crowd and to his disciples this is the sermon on the mount listen to what it says uh verse 38 of chapter 5 says you have heard that it was said eye for an eye tooth or a tooth but i tell you do not resist an evil person if he strikes you on the right cheek turn the other also verse 40 if someone wants to sue you this is in uh, a legal dispute they want to bring you to court they want to bring you to that bama seat out in public uh, and take they want to take your tunic let him have your cloak as well if someone forces you to go one mile go with him two miles give to one who asks of you and do not turn away from the one who wants to borrow from you He's saying, look, it's better that you would lose money or lose your possessions than to lose a brother or a sister in Christ or to lose your testimony. The Corinthians going to court against one one another was disgracing the name of the Lord and the church. And then he continues in verse 9 and 10. Then he does something very interesting. So back in 1 Corinthians, I want you to see this. He says, do you not know? They should know this already that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God. He's basically saying, look, the way you're acting is wickedness. 
He's saying, don't you know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. And church, I want you to know that the wicked have a particular way of life, and it will prohibit them from participating in the kingdom of God. And last week, uh, uh, Pastor Pete looked at six things in chapter 5. We add four things to a list of sins, but let's look at those. The first one is sexual immorality. That word there is porneia, where we get our word pornography. And what that means is any kind of perverse sexual involvement outside of God-ordained boundaries of one man and one woman for life. That's what that means, sexual immorality. Then it says idolatry. That's image, of, image worship. Then adultery comes back to sexual sin. That's a sexual relationship with someone other than your husband or your wife. He adds into the mix male prostitutes. You say male prostitutes. Well, in the context there, it's um, uh, effeminate, it, but it could be vice versa, male or female prostitution. And then he says homosexuality, same-sex partners. He's saying that's sinful. It, it, it shouldn't be. Uh, stealing and thieves, uh, uh, thievery, uh, theft. And then he talks about greediness, the desire for more. In this list, he says drunkenness, which is is those that are dependent on wine or any sort of substance abuse. And then he adds slander, uh, being untruthful, being mischievous. uh, Then he says swindling, which is financially taking advantage of someone. And that's what this is talking about in context here those last two being untruthful and bringing uh, false testimony or taking advantage of those that are less fortunate. And church, this warning, this, this word here to the Corinthian church, it was real. This would have hit them in the face and they would have been shocked that, that Paul was even addressing some of these things. But he's saying, look, the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God. What does that what does that mean? It means exactly what it says. Paul is, is, is saying again that you are just like the pagans who are surrounding you. You're greedy, you're fraudulent, not to mention your sexual immorality or your idolatry. He's saying the way that you're living is shameful and it cannot be tolerated. And he gives that list as a, just an example. And he's saying, look, we have got to be different. And boy, we're going to bring some application to our own lives here in just a minute. But then he goes on to verse 11. Listen to what he says. He says, and that is what some of you were. He knows that, that, uh, that many of those that were saved, those that he led to Christ, were some of these things. They were greedy. They, there was sexual immorality. They were full of idolatry. They were fraudulent. They were these things. But he's saying, look, you were those things, but that's past tense. He says, but you were washed. You've been cleaned up. You were sanctified. You were set apart. You were justified. There's that legal term. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. He's saying, look, don't forget who you are in Christ. You are in Christ. You are different. So live like that. And to the Corinthians, he's saying, look, stop defrauding. Stop living in sexual sin. And he's dealing with a real issue in real life for that day. Now, when I was thinking about this and just praying over these these verses and just saying, God, show me kind of what you have for us in these verses. How can we bring application to today? I want you to remember, first of all, that Paul, as he's talking about this, he's very real in his writing. It would have been very difficult for him to write these things. It was very confrontational, and there was a lot of tension uh, in these particular verses. But I see two things. Number one is the role of the church. And I want to talk to us as a church body, as the gateway church. 
Uh, we talked last week about Matthew 18, how we address sin within the church, how we deal with that. We go to someone on our own. If they don't respond, then we bring someone with us, and then we finally bring it to the church. And if the, the person refuses to repent or to follow God's word, then we talk about it publicly in front of the church. And we want to have the courage to be able to do that. Um, um, but I see as they continues from chapter 5 into chapter 6 and talking about legal issues and disputes or trivial matters, things that may come up between believers, uh, no matter what it is, and it could be believers within the same church or even believers from another church, another Christian, uh, dealing within, within, the, um, within the community. The church needs to be more active in some of these areas. When there's legitimate stuff, that it, there are issues among members of churches or attenders or other believers, let the church help. There are actually companies that do Christian mediation. I don't know if you realize this, and there, there are even some in the Grand Rapids market um, in where issues can be resolved from a Christian context. And I don't know what kind of things you may be facing today or how this even relates necessarily to your life today, but if there are things that arise between believers, there are grievances, there are difficulties, protect the cause of Christ. Don't take it to the public, but bring it to the church, and it's all about Christ, and it's about uh, everything that we do within the church. It needs to be sacred, and it really speaks to the, the, uh, the purpose of elders and good board members and good leaders and other trusted believers within the church. That if there are issues, you've been cheated uh, you know, in a car deal or you've been cheated you know, in business uh, some, some way, bring those things to the church. Not that we're looking for more things to do, but there's a proper way to handle these things. The role of the church in many, in, in many churches has been diminished. And they're saying, oh, just handle that outside of the church. No, the church is the place that we can get along and we can work on some of those hard issues. But then there's also another takeaway. Not only the role of the church, but I see in, these, in this chapter, uh, in these verses, the role of the believer. And this is where it becomes real personal to each and every one of us. I believe that our identity in Christ should affect our lives, the way that we live. And it's not to mean that we'll never have problems or we'll never have issues. That would be pie in the sky. But as a Christ follower, shouldn't the fact that Christ is living within us affect our business ethics, our personal ethics, our social life, our church life, in our school life, whatever? In, in every area, what we do, we do it for the glory of God. We read 1 Corinthians 9.23 and 1 Corinthians 10.31 uh, to start. And I want to just go back there just to remind you what Paul is saying. He's saying, look, everything I do, I do all of this for the sake of the gospel. Everything brings it back to Christ and Christ crucified. And then in chapter 10, verse 31, don't forget what he says. He says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of of God. And my question this morning is how many of us take these verses and we read and we kind of skim by a, a, a these verses when we normally would read and we don't really dig in and say, God, how does this affect our own lives? But I believe this morning God will want to say to you that everything that you do as a believer is sacred. The way that you live matters. Dealing with the immoral brother, of course, for the sake of unity, for the sake of your reputation as a Christ follower, and for the cause of Christ, we are called to live like believers, according to God's word, to the best of our ability. And what that does, it takes us beyond the amens and the hallelujahs of a Sunday morning service. 
and where the rubber meets the road and we get to, to really apply these things to our lives. And I'll tell you, when you start to sit with that truth and when you let God's word kind of sink in your heart and you start to look inside and you look at the way that you have handled your business affairs or your personal affairs or your social or your friends or your school or your money, all these things, all these areas of our lives that we're managing is Christ at the center of it all. And that's where it challenges me. And I want to challenge each and every one of us this morning. I'm going to ask that we bow our heads and close our eyes this morning. Uh, Brennan, you can come and uh, help me this morning as we prepare for some time of reflection, some time to respond to God and to His Word. This particular passage, uh, talking about litigation, talking about legal issues within the church, um, is often at times just overlooked. But my prayer this morning is that we would not just hurry up and pass over these verses, but that we would take to heart what Paul is trying to say. Paul is saying to the church, look, what you're doing, taking these problems outside of the church is not right. Even the youngest believer among us can discern your will, can discern God's will in many of these cases. And what was happening is that the church was being affected by the culture. They were being affected by the sin that was all around them. And it was affecting their identity as believers. And this morning, as we consider where we are today, each of us in our own lives, I want us to think about our own lives and think about our reputation. Think about what others from the outside, as they look at your life, what they would think. Do they even know that you're a believer, first of all? And if you do profess Christ and you are a Christ follower, is it affecting the areas of your lives? Or are you different on Sundays than you are on Mondays or on Friday nights when you're hanging out? Or the way that you spend your money or within business in the way that you handle your affairs? See, our call as believers is that Christ would transform us from the inside out. And if you are a Christ follower, it should be evident in your life. But the sad truth for the Corinthian church is that they were acting just like pagans. And the sad truth is, is in most American churches, there are believers that are going through the motions that aren't allowing the power of Christ, the power of the cross, to transform them in their day to day. And it's possible this morning, you're here today, and that's where you are. You're saying, Pastor, I'm, I believe I'm a Christ follower. I've, I've accepted Jesus. But if I was honest, my life is more disgraceful to the name of Christ than it is honoring to the name of Christ. The way I see it, church, with your head bowed and continued eyes closed, there's only two things that your life can represent. It can either honor Christ or bring disgrace to Jesus. And so take a moment. We've got a couple minutes here before, we, before we're done. Take a moment to say, God, help me search my life. Are there areas of my life that are displeasing to you? Are there areas of life where I'm bringing shame to your name? And it could be at school. It could be at the club. It could be with your friends. It could be personal.
personally, the way you spend your money. It could be your business practices. God, show us, reveal to us areas of our lives that are unpleasing to you. As we take a good look within our hearts and our own lives, this is very personal, I know. But I want to just ask you this morning to be honest before God, just you and God. How many this morning by the show of hands, say, you know what, there's areas of my life that are not bringing honor to Jesus. If that's the case, would you just lift your hands uh, just as a sign, just saying, hey, that's, that's the reality in my life. Yeah. A lot of different hands going up for different reasons, I'm sure. This morning, as we sit with that, that truth, my prayer is that we would move forward. We would address the issue of the issues at hand. And that we'd let God do a miracle in our hearts and in our lives. This is very personal, I know, but I'm going to ask that everyone would stand here just for a moment. And I want you just across this room because my my guess is that there are others that didn't raise your hand and I'm with them saying, boy, there are areas of my life that bring more disgrace to the name of Jesus than bring honor. And I'm just going to ask you to just repeat a quick prayer after me for those that raised your hands, even those that didn't. Would you just repeat, say this, this heartfelt prayer. Say, dear Heavenly Father, I'm sorry for the wrong in my life. For the way that I've affected your reputation. For the way that I've lived my life that is displeasing to you. And God, I commit today to change my ways. To seek your face. To know you more. Help me, Lord. I pray. Lord, I pray that your hand would be upon us, that you'd strengthen us, no matter what we're facing, that our lives would be full of integrity, that we'd be people that if we were sliced open, it wouldn't matter where we sliced, that we would be authentic, we'd be real, and Lord, that you would help us individually to serve you better. Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Now, there's another piece to this puzzle. Not only that individual piece, but then corporately. And I want to just challenge us as a body of believers to embrace this. That when there are grievances within the church, among believers, or even with other believers from other places, that we would follow Scripture that we would bring it to the leaders of the church to bring those matters before the church and uh, for the sake of Christ. And I, and I was trying to you know, think and brainstorm around this and, and I just believe that the Holy Spirit can reveal areas that we may need to address this and uh, there may be some things even this week that you need to deal with and we want to be available. We want to be the church that God wants us to be, that God wants us to be able to uh, handle some of these things together. And I also want to say that you may have been hurt by someone in the church. And can I say with a spirit of love, that God may be saying to you this morning to let it go, that any loss, whether it's possession or or money or just even just loss uh, of of relationship, can can we let it go for the sake of the gospel? Because our reputation, the Gateway Church in this community, 
in the state of Michigan and all across the world is more important than a little money or taking advantage of someone else. Does that make sense? And so I want to commission us to take God's word at his word and to live these things out. And this may not apply this week. It may. But it, at some point in your life, at some point in my life, we're going to need to take God's word at his word, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and to deal with some things because we're all people. We're all going to make mistakes. None of us are perfect. And we want to be humble. We want to be teachable. And we want God to help us in these areas. Amen? Amen. I want to pray a prayer of blessing. And then after I say amen, the altars are open. just want to encourage you to spend some time with the Lord before you leave. Uh, don't feel like you have to rush out. Um, and uh, But if you have to go, go in the grace of God. And then we'll see you on Friday or on Wednesday night at one of our prayer meetings uh, this week. All right? Lord, we just thank you for your word that convicts us, that challenges us, that changes us from the inside out. And God, I pray that this message will speak to each one individually. Lord, that there would be a sense that you are moving in our own hearts. You're revealing areas where we need to be sharpened where we need some action. And God, maybe this week we need to take the, the, uh, a grievance to the church. Maybe we need to ask some leaders, some elders, some, some board members to, to walk with us. Or maybe we just need to drop it all together. Just swallow hard and move on for the sake of the gospel. God, I pray that our reputation as a church would stay strong that you would protect us, God, as we desire to walk in your ways. And God, I thank you, God, for, for what you're doing here. And help us, Lord, to go in your grace. I pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The altars are open. I want to encourage you to come and pray uh, as the Lord leads you.